Good evening. This is James Stevens at Exploring God's Library. I hope you are doing well this evening. Um, the date is Tuesday, January 23rd, 2024. It's week 15, and the portion is Inter. And uh, if you're new, you're more than welcome to join us uh, on the journey this winter as we read through God's Library, and as revealed in this library of 66 books written by men of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The discipline of Bible reading is designed to complement your study of the Bible. It's a necessary component of your daily walk with God along with fellowship at a local church. This is how the Bible reading program works out. It only takes 20 minutes a day if you just read straight through the select passages. The scriptures, also known as the Law and the Prophets, are composed of 39 books widely known as the Old Testament. The first five books are known in Hebrew as the Torah, or the Law, or in Greek as the Pentateuch, the Five Scrolls. Each day we begin by reading a portion from the Torah called the Parsha, and in one year we'll systematically read through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This is a religious reading calendar uh, which dates back to the 6th century BC, established during the seven-year exile of the Jewish community known as the Babylonian captivity. To this day, everyone reads from the same chapters, which makes it easier to discuss the word on a daily basis. We'll then sequentially read through an assigned portion from the historic books and major and minor prophets. Additionally, we will read from the wisdom literature, the Psalm of the Day, the same seven psalms on a weekly basis, then one of the 150 psalms. In that way, we'll, we'll cover all 150 psalms twice in one year. And then we'll read one or two Proverbs, intentionally slowing down the pace so you can meditate on that passage during the day, applying the biblical idea of line upon line, precept upon precept. Finally, each day, we'll read a chapter from one of the 27 books of the New Testament. Every Tuesday evening, we'll review our readings and provide commentary drawn from various suggested resources. If you're not able to make it at that time, we'll post a link to that on Exploring God's Library. Please hit the subscribe button for additional teaching and resources. It's said in the Westminster Shorter Catechism that after God had made all other creatures, he created man, male and female, with reasonable and immortal souls, endued with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness after his own image, having the law of God written in their hearts and power to fulfill it, and yet, under a possibility of transgressing, being left to the liberty of their own will, was subject unto change. Besides this law, written in their hearts, they received a command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which while they kept, which, which while they kept, they were happy in their communion with God and had dominion over the creatures. Well, let's open in prayer, and we're going to... Uh, Read a prayer from the Valley Vision, and the Spirit is teacher. So bow our heads. O God, Holy Spirit, that which we know not, teach thou me. Keep us, keep us a humble disciple in the school of Christ, learning, learning daily that what I am in myself, a fallen sinful creature, justly deserving everlasting destruction. O let us never lose sight of our need of a Savior, or forget that apart from him we are nothing and can do nothing. Open our understanding to know the Holy Scriptures. Reveal to our soul that counsels and the works of the Blessed Trinity. Instill into our dark mind the saving knowledge of Jesus. Make us acquainted with his covenant undertakings and his perfect fulfillment of them. That by resting on his finished work, we may find, in the, find the Father's love in the Son, his Father, my Father. And may be brought through thy influence to have fellowship with the three in one. O oh, lead us into all truth, thou spirit of wisdom and revelation, that we may know the things that belong unto our peace, and through you be made anew, make practical upon our heart the Father's love as though as thou hast revealed it in scriptures. Apply to my soul the blood of Christ effectually, continually, and help me to believe with with conscience comforted that it cleanses from all sin, and lead Lead us from faith to faith, that we may at all times have freedom to come to a to a reconciled Father, and may be able to maintain peace with Him against doubts, fears, corruptions, temptations. Your office is to teach us to draw near to Christ with a pure heart, steadfastly persuaded of His love, in the full assurance of faith. Let us never falter in this way. Thank you, Lord, and we pray that Lord that you would speak to us and and that this. This hour or so would be profitable for reviewing the scriptures that we've read this week. 
and I thank you for the things that you've taught me. And I pray that some of these things will be conveyed. Give me the um, ability to articulate these things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first of all, we're, we're going to start with, uh, we start with the Old Testament. And um, the Old Testament is uh, for our edification. You know, that all scripture is, is God-breathed. And so we're going to start with Exodus. Uh, we're reading chapter 10 through chapter 13. And um, uh, we're looking at a little bit of background, uh, Pharaoh's reaction in chapter 9. The violent rain and thunder, coupled with lightning and fire, forced Pharaoh to call again for Moses and Aaron. No mention is made of wise men, magicians, or priests. It was obvious to the arrogant king that only Moses and Aaron had the key to the solution of his problem. The second observation of this king is that Jehovah was righteous. The statement is most significant since only a few months prior he refused to even acknowledge the existence of Jehovah. Finally, he admitted that he and his people were wicked, that is, had acted wrongly. One should not read too much into this confession. After all, he is a politician. None of this confession was witnessed by, by wise men. Uh, he was outmatched, and he knew it. Subsequently, his appeal to Moses was such that Moses did intercede to God outside the royal city. God heard his prayers, and the storm ceased, but relief from the plague did not. One cannot help but be touched by with the sorrow that must have existed in the thousands of homes throughout Egypt as they watched the devastation of their crops. Their deities had failed them. The destruction of their crop of flax was also significant in that this was the source of the linen used to clothe the priests in Egypt. Uh, I didn't know this. I was looking at, uh, I was at Huntington Gardens, Elizabeth and I, and we were looking at, at uh, different things that were made out of the garden, and it's made out of flax. It's uh, a white linen. And they, they actually made some from their own flax. If yes, you take it and put it in a, a big pot, thing of water and you let it work. Anyway, it's a very interesting process. Uh, chapter 10. Uh, the Exodus, the eight plagues, the lo lo locust. Locust plagues were very much feared in ancient Egypt, so much so that the, the peasants were in the habit of praying to the locust god. They actually prayed to a, a god, a locust god. Such plagues in Senegal and Sierra Leone in 1930 hit the whole of West Africa and had hit over 2,000 miles away. The plague lasted 14 years, 14 years, uh, and affected 5 million square miles of Africa. And that's an area double the size of the United States. I mean, the, the biggest thing that we had um, were the, uh, the Dust Bowl. And the dust uh, in the Dust Bowl was actually uh, experienced all the way to Washington, D.C. Um, so the stamina of the locusts is renowned. They're able to flap their wings nonstop for 17 hours at a cruising airspeed of 10 to 12 miles per hour and an average density of about 130 million per square mile. That's a lot of, that's a lot of locusts. And of course, remember that uh, John the Baptist, he existed on locusts and honey. Now, when I was growing up in Montana, um, we'd, uh, I, have to, I guess I would have to walk to school a mile uh, through the snow, <coughs> the bus. And, uh, and so I get to the bus and I'm, we're, walk, we're, we're, we're going to our little Ronan, uh, Ronan Elementary School. And uh, we always had interesting times with the farm uh, other farm boys because they would uh, one had ordered uh, some some uh, uh, french fried grasshoppers from san francisco so i had my first ta taste of french fried grasshoppers they weren't bad they were actually pretty pretty crunchy and pretty good uh, and then um, they also had baby bees and chocolate yeah, they were crunchy too it, not my favorite but um, it was the the, um, the locusts were actually like uh, uh, those little uh, shoestring potatoes, so they're pretty good. Um, the present cost to fight off a locust plague is about 30000 a day for a small army of 200 spray trucks and 1,000 workers, but even that proved inadequate as the locusts filled the houses of Pharaoh's servants. So it was, it was some kind of a, a plague for sure. The patients, and I did uh, put, put, a, um, put a film, or a clip from a film, which is a quite interesting film. Uh, it's called... Um, and the Good Earth by um, I forgot her name. Pearl S. Buck, right. And um, thank you, Elizabeth. She's help, helping me there. Um, Pearl S. Buck, and it's about a plague of locusts that hits them. And it's very, very dramatic and very frightening. The, 
The patience of Pharaoh was at an end, and he offered to Moses and Aaron a third compromise, allowing the grown men to go worship, but not the little ones and their families. Remember, uh, Moses and Aaron were saying, uh, let my people go, let my people go and worship. It wasn't leaving the land at the time, it was just to go into the countryside and actually uh, worship Yahweh, but they would have let him. Uh, this was unacceptable to Moses when he said, uh, Pharaoh said, um, he's not going to let the little ones or their families worship. And they were driven from Pharaoh's presence. Darkness in the land. The ninth plague, like the third and sixth, came without warning. When Moses' hand stretched toward heaven, darkness covered the land of Egypt, so thick that it could be felt. The usual answer is to assume that the land of Egypt was covered by a devastating sandstorm, known as the Kaisen, which are not uncommon in, in Egypt. Not a man was able to leave his house during this time of darkness, while the Israelites had light in their dwellings. Its miraculous nature is made clear by the fact that Israel did have light, did have light in Goshen, and were able to continue a normal routine. So that's supernatural. In the light of Egyptian theology and practice, this plague was very significant. To a large degree, it struck at the very heart of Egyptian worship. It humbled one of Egypt's greatest gods, the sun god Ra was considered one of the great blessings in the land of Egypt. So, um, so the ninth plague was darkness. And so um, that gives you a little picture of that plague of darkness. Then chapter 11, uh, there's the death of the firstborn announced. That was the firstborn uh, sons and also the first of oh, the firstborn and the firstborn animals as well. So this was really felt throughout that whole area. Um, and in chapter 12, the beginning of the year is changed. The Passover is instituted. The, import, the importance of the right of the Passover. I'm living bread because they had to make their bread before it rose. So just no, no, um, uh, no, nothing to make it rise. So it was flat bread, it's what you would call the, um, um, the matzah. And matzah has a lot of meaning. Some people would say the matzah has a meaning of, a, it looks like, uh, you know, stripes, um, and it's pierced. Um, and so you have the ordinance of the Passover is instituted where they, they actually have to go inside because the angel of death is coming over the land. So they had to uh, go to their post and lintel, which is their door. If you have a door, there's a thing to go straight up as a, as a post, and the top is a lintel. And they had to take, um, take a... Um, uh, hyssop and dip, dip it in actually blood from the blood of the lamb and they would paint it on their door so the when the angel of death went over they would they would pass over the, pass over pass over them that's the idea of passing over the angel of death passed over them and then the firstborn are sanctified to god in chapter 13 and the memorial of the passover is commanded and the first things of man and beast are set apart Okay, we're now going to look at uh, the prophets. Uh, we'll look at uh, uh, 2 Kings 10 through 12, 17. And um, it's very interesting, a lot going on here. And, uh, you know, somebody said, well, how, how many kings were there? You know, how many good kings, how many bad kings? Well, you can just basically say most of them were bad. And, uh, and there were just a few, you know, that were good kings. Um, I'm uh, uh, reading from John J. Davis. Uh, the last one I was reading from um, uh, John Davis on on uh, his uh, his look at uh, uh, from conquest to exile, um, and also John C. Wickham. And the, some of the things you're going to look at is you're going to Ahab's seventy sons are killed, his family, and then the worshippers of Baal are killed. And Jehu, by his letters, causes seventy of Ahab's children to be beheaded. And this is something they would do in in um, in the Old Testament, or actually in in the Middle East, is that uh, if you were you were to be feared, um, you would you would basically uh, behead your your adversaries, and then you would take that those heads and you would you would stack them in front of the city gate. So you knew that if you crossed the line, um, you would be you know, one of those heads that are before the city gates, but you wouldn't be. Uh, talking about it. Um, so uh, this whole thing with Jehon, uh, uh, Jehonadab, uh, he subtly destroys all the worship, 
worshipers of Baal. And they call them to the, the temple of Baal, and they go in, and they say, okay, I want you to go in. And he basically set guards around the place and uh, told them, okay, I'll get dressed. You know, you, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be um, honoring you or something. And then, uh, uh, and then, then those men uh, knew that they were to kill all the, all the, uh, the worshipers of Baal. And then, uh, so that's an interesting story. Um, but I'm going to look at, and then you also recognize that Athaliah reigns in Judah. Uh, they found out that, uh, uh, well, Athaliah massacres all the seed, the royal seed, but there's one that's hid in the, uh, six years in the house of God. And, uh, and so uh, he's protected, and then he becomes, uh, in the seventh year, he becomes the anointed king. They, they slay Athaliah, and Jeho Jehoiada restores the worship of God. So he's a really good, at this point, he's a good king. And then the, uh, Jehoash repairs the temple. Um, then he gives orders for the repair of the temple you know, because the money wasn't being spent. They, you know, they saved the money, but they didn't, uh, um, they didn't spend it properly. Uh, sound familiar? Um, and then the thir uh, Kings 13, um, Jehoaz has a wicked reign. He goes through oppression, and uh, Jeroboam succeeds him. Elisha is dying. He's one of the, the priests that uh, uh, that took over from Elijah, and he prophesies to uh, Joash three victories over the Syrians. And Mo Moabites and invade the land, and Elisha's bones raise a dead man, and Joash gets three victories over Ben Hadad. He was a, the bad the bad guy in the north. And, and so you have you have these reigns that are going on. Some are very short. And there's a Azariah's good reign. He, uh, he he dies as a leper. Jotham succeeds. And then you have um, in you have a lot of movement in the north. And then you have in in Second Kings twelve. You have Ahaz's wicked reign, and then in 17, this is where we're getting to. In 2 Kings 15, 30, it said, the 20th year of Jotham, which Calmet thus reconciled. So Isaiah conspired against Pekah, the 20th year of the reign of this prince, which was the 18th of Jotham, king of Judah. Two years after this, as the 4th of Ahaz and the 20th of Jotham, Hosea made himself master of a part of the kingdom, according to 2 Kings 15, 30. Finally, the 12th year of Ahaz, Hosea had a peaceable possession of the whole kingdom, agreeably. And he made it um, in 2 Kings 10, or 2 Kings 17. Uh, being subdued by Shalmanezar, he conspires against him. So king of Egypt, Samaria, for sinning, is led into captivity. The strange nations w were translated into Samaria, being plagued with lions, make a mixture of um, made a mixture of religions. And Kyle and Delich's commentary in Second Kings is quite interesting. It was a policy of conquering kings of mass deportation, the Syrian resettlement policy. This is something that's not new. Uh, this is something that's been done for ages. Um, it's been done with with um, Native Americans. It's been done in Europe and in the Middle East, and it was you know a Syrian pol resettlement policy. And I'm going to read a little bit about this. Because I think it's interesting um, that Scripture has a lot of application here, but we're dealing also with these um, strange nations which were plant transplanted to Samaria, being played with lions. Okay, well, who were those people? We'll get to that and why it's important. The practice of resettling population groups was a key constituent of the structural setup of ancient Near Eastern states, including the Assyrian Empire. This policy underpinned the high degree of cultural homogeneity and economic balance that characterized Assyria in the late 8th and 7th century BC, despite the vast climactic and geographical differences within the region. You remember you've heard that by the rivers of Babylon, and Joshua Aaron sings it. 
is the Bible contains a dark lament over the destruction of Jerusalem and the deportation of a sizable portion of its inhabitants to southern Mesopotamia as a result of the capture of Judah's capital by the army of Nebuchadnezzar II, king of Babylon, in the year 586 B.C. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat. This is in Psalm 137. And there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of those songs of Zion. But how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. The Babylonian captivity is not a unique case. It is one of many instances of the execution of the policy of enforced resettlement by then well documented in the ancient Near East for over two millennia. So it's, this has been this resettlement has been um, a policy for a long time. Uh, empires policy. This is why empires work. What makes it a special case is that we know about it from the point of view of those who were subjected to it and forced to leave their homes. But as we shall see, the Bible also contains evidence that enforced resettlement could be seen as beneficial to those that were subjected to it. Um, of course, you, you'd um, be hard to prove that for some of the Native Americans in this, this, this country. Um, they, they actually liken it to like um, somebody repotting plants, a diligent gardener. So... A convoy of Babylonian deportees leaves their captured city, organized and supervised by Assyrian officials. This is an example. Detail from the wall decorations of Tigla Pilasar III, Central Palace in Kalhu, um, founder of the modern Nimrod, later re reused in Esther Hardin's Southwest Palace. This is in the British Museum. Most Meso Mesopotamian sources offer the perspective of the state which ordered the relocation when relating their military victories and official inscriptions, rulers from the third millennium BC onwards habitually claimed to integrate defeated in enemy armies and the inhabitants of subjugated cities and lands into their own realm. The vocabulary used is either that of violence and pillage fitting for the context of war or that of a conscientious gardener, likening people to precious trees that are uprooted and replanted in the best possible circumstances. But how could enforced resettlement be perceived as positive for and by those affected by it. And we have our, we have had in the U.S. have had um, you know, legal immigration and, um, and that you get sorted out and you have to have something you're bringing um, to the party, so to speak, to make it a stronger country and had to have language and had to under, have understanding. But when the Syrian army laid siege to the city of Jerusalem in 701 B.C. during a campaign against the kingdom of Judah, the delegates of Sennacherib communicated a message to the people of Jerusalem according to the Bible. After urging them not to support their own king, who refused to submit to him, the Syrian king promised, Make your peace with me, come out to me. Then every one of you will eat of his own vine, every one of you will eat of his own fig tree, and every one of you will drink the water from his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, that you may live and not die, 2 Kings 18. Whether this quote is accurate or not, it's clear that what Sennacherib said is said to have used in his attempt to ensnare the people of Jerusalem was a chance to be resettled elsewhere in the Assyrian Empire. Deportation can indeed be regarded as a privilege rather than a punishment. <clears throat> people were not made to leave on their own, but did so together with their families. And it sounds like uh, some of the policies we're trying to do, but it's a much different situation. They were not snatched away in the heat of battle or conquest, but were chosen as a result of a deliberate selection process, which we used to have, but not now. Often in the aftermath of a war, they had very possibly reduced their original home to ruins, as in, as in um, Vietnam or uh, in, in uh, those type of things. And when the Assyrian sources specified who was to be relocated, they named their urban elites, craftsmen, specialists, and scholars. These people were usually dispatched to the Assyrian heartland to generate knowledge and scholars. And they were, hence by the beginning of the 7th century BC, the central Assyrian cities of Nineveh, Kalhu, and Assur housed experts from all over the no known world. Without them, some of the most enduring achievements of the Assyrian kings, such as constructing and furnishing the magnificent palaces and temples or assembling the contents of the 
fabled library of Asar by Nepal would have been impossible. And um, so forced resettlement can refer to very different scenarios. It's probably closest to our modern notion of deportation when we read in an, in an inscription of the Assyrian king Sargon that in 720 BC he pardoned 6,300 6, guilty Assyrians, had them settle in, in uh, the city in Assyria, formerly the capital of a, of a kingdom which had been defeated and integrated into the Assyrian Empire for 10, year, 10 years before. During the tumultuous time, Sargon's ascent to the throne the Assyrians in question had opposed his rise to power. After the struggle for control was decided in his favor, they had to be removed from the empire's power center. Deporting them to Hamat achieved this. By rebuilding the ruined but formerly important city, they were meant to repay the mercy of their king, who could have had them executed for disloyalty. As we have seen, elites from newly subjugated areas were resettled in the Asian Assyrian heartland to the economic and cultural benefit of the empire and disgraced Assyrians were deported rather than killed. So you put in exile in order to redeem themselves as uh, colonialists in the king's service. For all these people, relocation meant uh, to provide a better future while at the same time benefiting the empire, not just economically. Of course, the relocation of these people was also an effective way of minim minimalizing the risk of rebellions and insurrections against central authority. And they knew that I mean, you, you see in the letters, some I mean, the actual letters that you're reading in the Bible from um, uh, when, when the kings were, at, kings were being asked during uh, Nehemiah's time, um, the people were opposed in, in Jerusalem. They're opposed to the, the Jews rebuilding the wall. Sounds familiar. And, uh, and so they're writing letters to the king saying, these people are rebels, you know, do you know what you're doing? And uh, and so they actually had to go and to, um, look at the history of that that people. And so, um, but then the, the king actually allowed them to do it. Um, so, now the empire's prophets were of paramount importance for the third type of deportation, which affected by far the largest number of people and transformed the Near East most profoundly. The intricate colonization policy was meant to make the most of the resources of the entire empire. Masterminded by the central administration, population groups from within the boundaries of the empire, and not just from recently subjugated enemy regions, were systematically moved around in order to achieve a variety of objectives, all of which one thing, they had one thing in common. They were meant to provide stability to the empire politically, structurally, economically, and culturally. While growing out of the customary integration of conquered armies and populations, the blueprint for these planned migrations was developed from the 9th century BC onward and gained momentum in the second half of the 8th century BC with the massive expansion of the Assyrian state, which necessitated the integration of an area equal in size to that of the mother country. The organization of the resettlement policy became one of the most important tasks of the state and provincial administrators. In the course of following the following centuries, population groups numbering in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, were either transferred from one region to another, moved around in more convoluted patterns. So they were, they were taking the people that they had conquered or that had immigrated, and were, they were using them to actually uh, enrich their own country. So it was part of their own policy. Um, they were to develop barren lands and to introduce to the Assyrian provinces new and hitherto neglected cultivation techniques such as irrigation, beekeeping, cultivation, and production of flax, wine, or oil. And those who worked the land assigned to them and paid taxes were the property's legal owners. And at least in the eyes of the state, the new arrivals were not treated any differently from those whose families had lived on their land for generations. Now this does pose some problems. And uh, you can see this in the... Uh, the the U.S.'s um, mistreatment of Native Americans and breaking, breaking over 900 treaties with Native Americans, all in the name of Christ, by the way, um, but not a, not a good thing. The intricate colonization policy was meant to make the most of the resources of the entire empire. Masterminded by the central administration, population groups from within the boundaries of the empire, and not just from recently subjugated enemy regions, 
were systematically moved around in order to achieve a variety of objectives, all of which have one thing in common. They're meant to provide stability to the empire politically, structurally, economically, and culturally. So this is someone else planning your life for you, a government planning your life that has a lot of problems. And while growing out of the customary integration of conquered armies and populations, the blueprint for these planned migrations was developed from the ninth century, onward gave momentum. And um, so in keeping with the, the employed gardening metaphors, which likened the deportees of valuable plants to be transferred to a new nurturing environment. Um, I think it's uh, you need to talk to Native Americans about that. And then also a lot of these uh, these these policies were actually copied by Chinese. How how do we treat our minority groups, our mi minority peoples like the Uyghurs, the Tibetans, etc.? Well, we'll do what they did in, in America. So um, not always um, very glorifying to God for sure. Um, so these uh, deportees, it's it's interesting that they said in this this article that we must not imagine treks of destitute fugitives or easy prey for famine and disease. The deportees were meant to travel as comfortably and safely as possible in order to reach their destination in good physical shape, you know, being working. But even America. Um, uh, Cesar Chavez, who um, led the, the labor movement in America for farm laborers, giving them you know, proper care, etc., um, he, he was very opposed to illegal immigration because it really hurt the people. And then, of course, his, he passed away, and then his, his daughter's very pro um, illegal immigration. But these deportations, uh, these actually happen. Uh, these deportations are depicted in Assyrian imperial art. Men, women, and children are shown traveling in groups, often riding in vehicles and or animals and never in bounds. There is no reason to doubt these depictions as the Syrian narrative art does not otherwise shy away from the graphic display of extreme violence in contemporary text sources. So, so very interesting. Um, now, this is a problem. This is, uh, this is from their writings. As for the Arameans, about whom the king, my lord, has written to me, prepare them for their journey. I shall give them food supplies, clothes, a water skin, a pair of shoes, and oil, and a cell phone. Uh, I do not have my donkeys yet, but once they are available, I will dispatch my convoy. So they were they were doing this, and a lot of the, the these people are now coming through the, I mean, this is a whole different situation, but it's, um, it's the same kind of pattern, except that the cartels are moving people into the U.S. and using them as, as, uh, as, as mules, you know, donkeys. I mean, mules with drugs, etc. Um, the state continued to support the deportees once they had reached their destination. It's clear from another letter of the same author. Isn't it interesting how it's, things are just repeating themselves? I mean, you read the Bible and you think, oh, the Bible's not relevant. No, it is. If you study it, it's very relevant. Because remember, things are being passed on and not always the best pattern. As to the Arameans, about whom the king, my lord, had said, they are to have wives. We found numerous suitable women, but their fathers refused to give them in marriage, uh, claiming, we will not consent unless they can pay the bride price. Let them be paid so the Arameans can get married. So they were having problems with the uh, population, um, you know, having a male or a brides kind of. And as we've seen, the Assyrian resettlement policy divided existing communities into those who had to stay and those who had to leave, according to the needs of the state. Populations were relocated within the boundaries of the empire, replacing and being replaced by people who were themselves moved. Our last source especially highlights um, the fact that state authorities actively encouraged a mixing of the new neighbors. The ultimate goal of the Assyrian resettlement policy was to create a homogeneous population with a shared culture and common identity, that of the Assyrians. And so, um, depending upon who's in power in America, would, were they trying to change the, they're trying to change the... Uh, the, uh, culture. Um, it's not a shared culture, but you have a lot of debates on those things. And so, um, now, um, the Syrian kings Shalmanzar and Assar then settled those people they had conquered. The last remnant, this is very interesting, the last remnant of the ten tribes. Not all those who were transplanted through conquest were Hebrews, as their policy was to mix the populations. Sounds like the melting pot policy of the U.S., 
or the Trail of Tears of the Nazi policy of separating Jews from the mainstream population. Evidently, the Jews found themselves mixed among the Nestorians, which were an ancient uh, Christian faith uh, the, uh, in the east, in Assyria. According to Josephus, the ten tribes were still in the land of their captivity in the first century. According to Jerome in the fifth, and then in the present day, they are still in the country of the ancient Assyrians. Since the Nestorians, both according to their own statement and according to the testimony of the Jews there, are ben, ben the Israel, um, you know, sons of Israel. And that of the ten tribes are also proved to be Israelites by many of the customs and that they have preserved. In the book of Daniel, how many satraps were accountable to Daniel? I mean, um, Darius appointed 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. And the head of the administration of this province, the satrap, called, what they did is they collected taxes, they're like a governor. They were supreme judicial authorities and responsible for internal security and raise and maintain an army. Um, Kyle and Delich said, uh, In general, the Israelites and Jews who have come into heathen lands from the time of Salmanazar and Nebuchadnezzar onwards have settled there, have become so mixed up with the Jews who were scattered in all quarters of the globe from the time of Alexander the Great, and more especially since the destruction of the Jewish state by the Romans, that the last trace of the old division into tribes have almost entirely disappeared in exile in Babylon. And they didn't cease to be people because they fo looked forward to return to their fatherland after a banishment of 70 years. I mean, they were waiting for that 70 years. Remember Daniel, he was waiting. But after the heathen colonists had been transplanted into the land with whom the remainder of the Israelites and the land became fused, and so there arose mixed Samaritan people of predominantly heathen character, it was impossible to speak any longer of a people of Ephraim in the land of Israel, one of the, the tribes, right? In the earliest period of their resettlement in the city of Samaria, the new settlers were visited by lions. Well, how, how does that happen? Which may have been multiplied during the time the land was laying waste. Remember, a lot of these places were laying waste and there was nobody you know, taking care of the land. The settlements, the settlers regarded this as a punishment from Jehovah, from the deity of the land, in whom they did not worship. And therefore, they asked the king of Assyria or a priest to teach them the right, uh, the proper, the worship of the God of the land. Whereupon the king sent them one of the priests who had been carried away. And he took up his abode in Bethel and instructed the people in the worship of Yahweh. The author of our books also looked upon the outlines that sent by Jehovah as a punishment. According to Leviticus 26, the new settlers did not, because the settlers did not fear him. But the priest sent by the Assyrian king was, of course, an Israelitish priest of the calves. He was one of those who had been carried away and resettled in Bethel, the chief seat of Jeroboam's uh, uh, worship. And he taught the colonists fear or worship after the manner of the land. This explains the divine worship in the land. It's described every separate nation made itself its own gods. And so they were, they were uh, setting things up in the high places. They were worshiping calves. They weren't worshiping Jehovah. They, you know, had had, uh, and that was Samar the Samaritans. So, okay, well, that gives you really a big background. Now, how does this how does this apply to today? Does it occur today? I recall attending a ceremony at the Norton Simon Wiesenthal Museum of Tolerance to cover their awarding the Dalai Lama uh, Peace Prize, and the Dalai Lama was accepting this. And uh, he said, I'm encouraged by the support of your community, which has been had many difficulties and sufferings. I feel like an elder brother, and I easily understand the troubles of our other brothers, said the Buddhist holy man, who has known, who has known the subjugation of his people in exile by China for 37 years. Since I have been a refugee and living in India, Dalai Lama said, I've thought that the Jews must have some secret to survive in different countries, often in hostile communities, and have never given it up. So he he actually, he said, I would like to steal some of your determination and the keeping of your tradition. So he was actually patterning himself after the Jews because he was afraid that the Tibetans in exile would lose their, their, their faith. And so they got resettled in America in all these places with the priests, with artisans, etc. So they were one little tight little community. Um, well, one of the other things we're reading... Um, 
as about the uh, the bear in uh, Elijah, I think Elijah, Elisha, who uh, uh, was sent to maul children. And um, let's look at the context of the story. Title: Elisha succeeds Elijah. It's about how Elijah was in a most challenging time of taking over from the great prophet Elijah, who was swept up into heaven in a chariot of fire. Remember that. God endorsed him as a successor to Elijah in dramatic and eye-catching ways. Dividing the river, he is crossing right in front of the faithful sons of the prophets, purifying Jericho's polluted water, and disciplining a gang of ruffians who were ridiculing and rejecting God and his prophet. We read how Elijah, the prophet of God, was entering one of the worst places in the corrupt and decadent nation of Israel. Although Bethel was called the house of God, what should have been the holy place was a center of idolatry and immorality, where the sons of God were vastly outnumbered by those who taunted and trashed the faith of Elijah and Elisha. Bethel was so bad that a gang of young teenagers harassed Elijah, telling him to leave them in their town alone and go be with his God, as Elijah had done. They were saying, "Yo, you bald, you baldy." And, um, it's unlikely these youths were younger than twelve years old. Contrary to the character, Elisha was a young man, probably in his mid twenties, although obviously bald. We are reminded that the real issue was not how this gang showed contempt and disrespect for God's prophet, but revealed utter disrespect for the Lord. Therefore, a strong message was sent to the city and parents, reminiscent of Leviticus 26, 21 through 22. The scripture tells how hostility toward God and an unwillingness to obey him can result in being besieged by plagues and wild animals. So this is already, God is already teaching us lessons. And, and that's what happened that, you know, that, the group had been put in exile. The message was a corrective message to address current attitudes and behavior that if heeded would ward off sins and greater judgment. The gang was shocked and silenced when mauled, not necessarily killed by the bearers, and their parents and community were warned to repent of their sins, reflected in their children, and obey God before worse judgments befall them. That means parents, parents are the, really the key to taking care of the next generation. Walter Kaiser writes how the eventual fall of Israel would have been avoided had the people repented after the bear attack. They did not. According to 2 Chronicles 36, 16, we read how they kept ridiculing God's messengers, despising his words, scoffing at his prophets. As Kaiser wisely states, the bear attack shows God trying to repeatedly to bring his people back to himself through smaller judgments so they could avoid a worse, uh, worse full, um, full force judgment. This is... Um, based on some things that Paul Baxter, he's a retired pastor uh, and director of missions in the Pine Mountain Baptist Association. Lisa Archer puts everything into perspective when he describes this large roving band of teenagers as a serious public danger, quite as grave as the large youth gangs that roam the ghetto sections of our modern American cities. And we've seen this, right? And, uh, and a lot of the, uh, the trains that come out of, uh, of Long Beach are just pilfered. I mean, the, you know, they they get upon and they take everything they can find in those places. The Hebrew phrase for small boys referred to adolescents from 12 to 30 years old. It's unlikely this youth were younger than 12 years, 12 years old. Contrary to the character of Elisha, right, talked about that. Um, okay. Moving right along here. Um, I've been thinking and praying about someone's somewhat sarcastic remark to me a while ago when I, uh, when I posted about the bear situation in Sierra Madre and the 120 ta 122 break-ins. The 122 break-ins, which is three times the amount of break-ins, where these bears would come in with their cubs and they actually break into the house. <laughs> and this sounds really like, you know, like a, a thief somewhere where they're little thieves. And they break into the house. And, and uh, we've actually talked to people, I mean, that have... have had this happen with one guy in the canyon had had um, um, they had their place broken into. They actually leave their back door open now so they can leave. But uh, some break in and uh, they bring their own cubs. So they're training their cubs to do this. So it's generation, generationally uh, passed on. It's happening in uh, Lake Tahoe as well. Um, some, some of these bears have broken into 60 places and have... Um, uh, have been training their three cubs. So uh, I had uh, someone made a sarcastic remark to me in the, on the blog, says, why don't you pray them away? 
It started me thinking about the situation more deeply. Rather than taking it as an offense, I took the critique as something to consider. I've read many of the posts and comments, followed the episodes with, with delight, sometimes terror, heard other stories on the street, met and talked with Mackenzie and Jessica, and who um, actually worked for the uh, Fish and Game, watched the videos and prayed and done research. Some of the following quotes I have gleaned, which made sense to me. Forgive me for not giving credit to all those quotes um, to whom credit is due. It is evening and much of this is on the fly and it is much too long for most of now time to post and rest. I would be great to hear your thoughts as well if you are if you're led. Job said to, to the wisest man in the east, uh, he was the wisest man in the east, said, but now ask the beasts and they will teach you and the birds of the air and they will tell you. It's easy to fall back on our own understanding and while some of the ideas or possible solutions are very pragmatic, but as I prayed, I thought, are we missing what God is telling us through the beast? I know that sounds really strange, but but it's what Scripture says. Now ask the beast, and they will teach you. And the birds of the air, they will teach you. I mean, um, we were walking out of the street, and we actually saw the bird, the, the bear cages, because this one couple had uh, had a bear that came in their front door and was you know, in uh, eating in the kitchen. I mean, it's it's uh, it's kind of a reversal of the the. Uh, um, you know, the Goldilocks and three three bears. You know, I mean, they're they're just looking everywhere. Um, but the wise men, for he sees the wise men die, the fool and the senseless person perish, and leave their wealth to others. The inner thought is that their houses will last forever, their dwelling places to all generations. They call their land after their own names. Nevertheless, man, though in honor, does not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. In Psalm forty nine ten through twelve. God speaks, Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sac sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bowl from your house or goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle in a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. So call upon me in the day of your trouble. I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. In Psalm 57 through 11, I think it's a very important. You thought that I was altogether like you. I think that's something that we all think. God just like us, you know, but he's not. One of the early saints of the church, Saint Assisi, made peace with the wolf. If we cannot make peace with the bear, God will send other beasts to teach us lessons. And I was looking, um, a lot of the, the bears are now in hibernation, but, um, but now uh, you have... You have lynxes, you have uh, tiger uh, uh, lynxes uh, in the garbage that you had with bears before. So there, there's a very delicate balance. And you're, the, and these bears were actually imported here. So you're dealing with, with illegal, well, they, they're legal because they're brought here, but, but they're like illegal. And um, so... Uh, Francis of Assisi was 1181 to 1226 on um, the Christian era. He was canonized as a saint by the Catholic Church only two years after his death. We don't worship saints. Uh, but he's perhaps the best known medieval saint among Catholics, Protestants, and other people of other religions. In uh, Proverbs 6, 6 through 9, it says, You lazy people, you should watch what the ants do and learn from them. Ants have no ruler, no boss, no leader. But in the summer, ants gather all of their food and save it. So when the winter comes, there's plenty to eat. So why is the bear hungry now? He is hungry and fattening up to go into the hibernation. He is making the best of his local resources. She is feeding her cubs and teaching them to hunt and use their senses to find food. In Genesis uh, 2, 15, humans are placed in the Garden of Eden, instructed to work it and take care of it. In other words, God has given us the responsibility to act as stewards of his creation to care for, manage, oversee, protect all that God owns. What an honor and a privilege. And we're not tree huggers. We're, we don't, we're not tree worshipers. Um, we actually, we, uh, we're not, like in Romans, you know, those that worship, uh, you know, the creation, not God. No, we're, we're, we re worship the creator, um, the maker of these things. Now, this doesn't give us free license to exploit and abuse God's earth. As stewards, we need to act in the owner's best interests, treating his property with respect as God. We must not use it in a way that causes harm to our neighbors or one of his creatures. One day we will have to give an account to God of how we treated his earth. 
I read another post, uh, beware of, of the highly contagious, why bother disease? This is a moral and spiritual issue. What I do in my daily life doesn't matter. The immediate consequences of my actions might not be felt by me, but they will be certainly affect someone else. St. Sisi preached the message that they were as much God's creatures as a human race and as such should be protected. His benevolent attitude towards animals and nature was the reason he became known as the patron saint of animals. What's the lesson the beasts are teaching us? Words of Jesus to his apostles. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on. Is life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly, heavenly Father feeds them. Francis of Assisi is known as a lover of animals. He preached to the birds, tamed the savage wolf, and talked to whichever animal would listen to him. Today we might have called him crazy, but he was a man of great faith, and many of you have his statue in your gardens. We don't. Um, we don't pray to the saints, but to God for that protection. So how do we appreciate our fellow creatures? The birds take what they need daily. Um, he's saying to the animals as well. One of my friends, Don Upham, the fire chief, actually sang over his area that he saw fires were breaking out all the time. This is in the San, San Gabriel Valley. Soon he rarely saw action. Uh, one man who stood in for him on shift said, I'll see if I can cook a fire today. Don said to him, no, as a Christian, we, we should be in prayer for our region. He was over a great deal of the San Gabriel Valley. Many years ago, he moved back east to be closer to his son. Since then, many hellacious fires have broken out, as you know. We've been given authority and responsibility by God to steward the wonderful creation we've been given to live in. We just need to humbly exercise it and seek God, read his word, and hear his voice. He is speaking in all his creation is speaking. So God, what are you teaching us through the bears? Maybe we should say to the bears, please don't come into our homes. We won't harm you. You wouldn't want us to come into your caves and disturb your dwelling or your little cubs, would you? Just like St. Francis spoke to the wolf, God give us faith, preach to the bears. Can you not be swimming in my pool or tearing, tearing my screens? It might be a little much to ask. We used to live under an oak tree, and each fall the acorns would rain on our roof, and the squirrels' pace picked up as they raced to bury their treasures for the winter. But it was only for a season. Is this bear fattening time only for a season? Does their presence scare off other wild predators we don't see, like cougars, coyotes, and mountain lions? You may know, I don't. The majority of us don't want to see bears killed, and certainly we don't want our loved ones mauled either or frightened. We are learning. What is this revealing about our heart? We're listening. Please teach us what you're teaching through your creation. Thank you. We can humbly ask God to bring a little heaven to earth here in Sierra Madre, as in the coming millennium where the lion will lie with the lamb, not naively, but expectantly, in the way he directs, teaches us, instructs us. And guide us with your eye. That's what it says in Psalm 32. Uh, so, um, now look at the New Testament. Um, we're out of time. Um, in Christian scholarship, the book of signs is a name commonly given to the first section of the Gospel of John. From 119 to the end of chapter 12. It follows the hymn to the word. and precedes the book of glory. It is named for seven notable events, often called signs or miracles, that it records. First of the signs was changing the water into wine in Cana and healing the official son in Capernaum, healing the paralytic, feeding the 5,000, Jesus walking in water, healing the man blind from birth, that's a great one, the healing, the raising of Lazarus after four days of being dead, and, um, uh, and then of course a lot of these songs come to mind when they're reading about you know, feeding the 5,000 bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. I mean, weary traditional hymns. And, um, and then many disciples turn away from Jesus, but some stay. You know, they're like, where else would we go? And Jesus' brothers disbelieved. They didn't believe until they could see. You know, he rose from the dead. And um, then you have... Um, 
uh, in in John eight, you have before Abraham was I am. Then the then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Why do you make yourself, who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. You have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your, um, who, else, who else speaks like this with such authority? Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You're not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And of course, what was, who, who did, uh, how did God identify himself on uh, Mount Sinai? He said, I am. Because he was asking, Moses said, Well, if I go to, go to, to tell the, the Hebrews that, you know, that I've been sent, how do I respond to some, I am sent you? So they took up stones to throw at him, but this is the, Pharisees, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going to the midst of them. And this is really important. This this area of the, um, you know, when you're looking at the uh, John chapter nine, the man that was born blind was restored to sight. He was brought to the Pharisees. That's such a fascinating story. I mean, I just l love reading it um, because this really counters a lot of our our kind of pluralistic ideas, you know, because we're, uh, the, the American Christian, many of them, including myself, before I came to Christ, um, uh, are confused about these things. I mean, a lot of people still believe in reincarnation that are, they're Christians. And this says that, no, we're not talking about reincarnation. Who, why is this man born? Why is he blind from birth? Uh, he said, uh, Rabbi, who sent this man or his parents that he was born blind? Okay, there's a very specific issue here. Well, um, he, Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. This is a work that glorifies God. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And so, so this man is healed, and he's been blind from birth. So it's not because of his karma, you know, that... Well, he did bad things. It's not because his parents did something bad. It's because it was for the glory of God. So it's very, very uh, instructive. Um, and then, of course, um, I, I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm going to have to move on here. But um, Jesus heard this because the Pharisees answered and said to, to the man who was saying, why is this a marvelous thing that, that you do not know where he is from? <laughs> Yet he opened my eyes. Now we know what God does not hear. We know that God does not hear sinners if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will. He hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not of God, he could, not, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sins, and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. It's just terrible. And uh, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. So he identified, I am God. So, and Jesus said, For the judgment had come into this world that those who do not uh, do not see, may see, and those who see may be made blind. And some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, 
we see, therefore, your sin remains. On the whole, when this, this is uh, something I, I was reading in a book on the glory of God. It says, on the whole, one is struck by the, the mutuality and reciprocity entailed by many of the references to glory in John's Gospel. As mentioned, both the Father and Jesus are frequently said to be recipients of glory. Most commonly, is the Father receiving glory through Jesus and acting in turn to bring glory to Jesus. This dynamic finds its culminating expression in Jesus' final prayer. Quote, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me with your own presence, for the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And so, this is um, this is talking about the 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 uh, that Jesus has always been. It's not like oh, he just was born, and uh, no, he's he's he had his, he had the presence with the glory that he had before the world existed. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, "Father, the hour has come." And so. Glorify me together with yourself in the glory which I had with you before the world was. So, it's talking about his, you know, the glory of God. It's um, and it's important. You know, these are little things that are very important because um, there are groups. Not to get into depth, it, it's just touching on it. There are people that say, "Oh, God didn't become God until he was, he was, um, or Jesus, Jesus was born and then he became." These are like monarchical modalists. So it's a, it's a, it's a, something that people fall into. I've talked to them, and I think they're also in, involved in oneness, Pentecost, Pen, oneness Pentecostalism, and also in uh, the Mormons, etc. And that you know, it's a very strange uh, view of God. Well, that just gives you a little bit. Um, um, we have some this week uh, is is um, uh, the marker of the week we're coming into what's called Tish B'Av in the Jewish calendar, which is the New Year of the Trees. And um, and so this is the, kind of a Jewish Arbor Day, but it's, uh, it's giving honor to trees. And what are the three three trees mentioned in the Bible? Tree number one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden, the tree of death. And number two, the tree on Mount Cal Calvary, the tree of sacrifice. And number three, the tree of life. This tree can be found in Revelation 22, which describes the new Jerusalem, or heaven. In Psalm 92, speaking of trees, man is compared to trees. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. So, Tish B'Had is a Jewish holiday. It begins uh, at sunset on January 24th, and it ends in the evening of January 25th. It's also called the Rosh Hashanah La Lanot, literally the New Year of the Trees. Um, and I think it's, it's interesting. Um, Chosen People Ministries explains how this minor holiday ought to be seen by believers. And he said, there are a few ways that a follower of the Messiah can think about um, uh, Tish B'Had, B'Bat. And it said, good earth, good fruit, bad fruit. Trees are certainly a significant image in Scripture, including the New Testament. Our Rabbi Jesus, for instance, compared people to trees in that they both produce fruit. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know, know them by their fruits. The Tishbahat can be a call to examine ourselves. What kind of fruit are we bearing? Our fruit can take the form of words or actions. It's not a, it's not a like a, you know, um, Passover, nothing, nothing like an official holiday. It's kind of like a, a minor holiday, but it's it's giving honor to, honor you know to, the things that feed us, from God. We don't honor the trees. We honor God, who's who created these things. Um, and so Tish is can be a call to examine ourselves. What kind of fruit are we bearing? Our fruit can take the form of words or actions. Their external signs reveal the state of our hearts, whether good or bad. 
constantly spending money on frivolous items might be an indicator that one struggles with the love of money. Hebrew 13.5. And this is something that uh, Johnny Appleseed, this is really great, by the way. Um, there's a book um, which I recommend all the, like, homeschools, I think, would really gain. It's called Johnny Appleseed. It's a sower series, and it's so interesting. I mean, I've seen these uh, you know, cartoons on Johnny Appleseed, but it doesn't really give honor to the fact that he was a Christian and that uh, he he uh, basically was not just sowing the seeds of, of apples throughout this country, but he was sowing the seeds of God's Word. And so everywhere he went. But his stories are just magnificent. And... Uh, um, he realized that the earth is the Lord's, and and one of the things that that um, that he had a problem with is is that well, I really want land, and um, he was feeling humbled by God. He got bit by a rattlesnake, and uh, and he had to actually cut up the rattlesnake poison out of his leg, and then he went into like a you know into a kind of a, a dream state because he was dying, but he actually lives. And, um, and he's afraid that he was insulting God, that God gave him everything. And so now he's, oh, I've got to have land. He said, am I being, you know, and, and by the way, I mean, this guy, he traveled throughout the U.S. He, he uh, traveled barefoot. He had a pot on his head, it's true. And, um, and so, and he took a lot of seed with him. And, um, and so, by, but by the end of his life, he had 640 acres because he was taking land that nobody wanted and he plant uh, plant trees there and he had orchards and he had uh, nurseries etc and so I mean God God used the man in, in marvelous ways and his stories about um, about his uh, humility I mean he he had a, a slave and this is from my recall from long long ago he had a slave that knocked on his door and he was a runaway slave and you can't have you know runaway slaves but he thought about scripture and he's like, you know, I can't turn these slaves, you know, slaves, slaves in. And so he watched them and, and uh, um, you know, and took care of the man. A really marvelous story. Um, so the earth is the Lord's and all that contains the world and those who dwell with, within it. The fact should give us a humble mindset. The earth's resources do not ultimately belong to God's. God made them for humans to use but not to exploit. <coughs> And so we have to make peace with some of these issues. And, um, you know, how do we take care of these trees? And, you know, God for his provision. And um, we're thinking about it would be a great day to, you know, to plant a tree, a fruit tree. And uh, I know that um, the care of trees that, that were planted years ago at uh, William Carey International University by the Pasadena Nazarene, they were... You're planted because they take a hundred years to grow, to bear fruit. Many of them got cut down, which is very sad. But um, there was a young man who said, "Grandpa, why are you planting this carob tree?" And he said, "He said he, he said you're never going to eat this carob, but it takes a hundred years to grow." He said, "But you will." <laughs> so he took care of the next generation. So I think it's a really beautiful. Um, okay, well, um, so celebrate New Year for trees. Um, can be encouraging. So we've talked about uh, John Chapman and uh, also uh, Resources of the Week, Bible Bible Gardens. I've been reading about Bible Gardens. Um, they have some amazing gardens in, in Israel. They also had some in, uh, in Virginia. And also, just locally, uh, at the, the Arboretum, they used to teach, uh, they used to have a tour of Bible plants. And um, our friend that we call Call him, he calls himself Arboretum Al. Uh, they can give a, a tour over there. So I think sometime that might be fun. All right. Memory verse. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. That glorifies God. And the prophecy in Exodus is not a bone of the lamb that is broken. And um, and we know that, that, um, uh, that when he was on the cross... Um, his legs weren't broken. They usually break their legs at a certain time uh, to, to hasten their death because they wanted to bury the bodies uh, before uh, the sun went down. And, uh, and 
the the men that were in charge of doing that looked at him and said he's already dead. That's why they pierced him. And so the blood and the water came out, but not a bone of the lamb was broken. All right. Okay, so that's... Um, um, I'm just closing a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, that has placed in the church, which your son purchased by his own blood. Add grace to grace that we may live worthy of our vocation. We are voyagers across life's ocean, safe in heaven's ark. May we pass through a troubled world into the harbor of eternal rest. We are a tree of the vineyard you have planted. Grant us not to be barren with worthless leaves and wild grapes. Prune us of useless branches. Water us with the dews of blessing. We are part of the Lamb's Bride, the Church. Help us to be true, faithful, chaste, loving, pure, devoted. Let no strong affection wantly daily with the wor world. May we live high above the love of things, temporal, scarified, cleansed, unblemished, hallowed by grace. Thy love, our fullness. Thy glory, our joy. Thy precepts, our pathway. The cross, our resting place. Our heart is not always a flame of adoring love, Lord, but we rest in your Son's redemption. We look forward to the days of heaven where no languor shall oppress, no iniquities chill, no mist of belief dim our eyes, no zeal ever tires. Father, these thoughts are the stay, prop, and comfort of our soul. Thank you for this time, and we pray that it may be profitable for encouraging everyone. Thank you for the studies I've been able to do. I've been so encouraged by your spirit, Lord, in finding these things. Um, bless each of the, bless each of the, uh, um, the readers. Um, bless uh, Dave and Kimmy as they're in Tanzania, and, and um, they're in an area where, where there are been about 600, 600 um, lions. They have men eating lions in Tanzania, and the people walk on roads, and they're they're actually being they're being hunted by these man eaters. We pray that um, they would not turn to the turning, believe me, these are demons. And we pray that they would turn to the living God and that uh, you would give them peace in the land. Oh Lord. And we pray for pray for um, Lori and um, comfort her after her mother and father passed away in, in, in um, December. We also pray for Vanessa, our, our daughter-in-law and her father who's or her grandfather who's in the hospital have two blood transfusions we pray that you lift him up and lord we also pray for for chuck um bishop chuck um that he he would be you would lift him up from the pain he's been please help him in his pain i i i'm i don't like pain nobody likes pain we pray for him he needs, needs that help, Lord, and not drugs, but but your your hand, your hand of blessing, Lord, reach in and bless him. And Lord, we pray also for um, pray for uh, Cindy that she's feeling better. She's down in San Diego. Pray for all the the terrible uh, weather they've been having um, along the coast and all the flooding of these channels. Oh Lord, we pray for pray for local people in this area. Bless them and keep them. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good evening. Have a great week. Thank you for joining us.